Mike, thanks so much for joining me on the Magnetic Mary Method podcast. This is especially exciting since it's been a number of years since you yourself took the Magnetic Mary Method training, and I just had been reaching out with people, and you came back with an amazing story. But before we dive into that, just what 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 should we know about you as a as a person? What do you do, and how did you get involved in memory training in the beginning? Well, I am an engineer. I work in electrical engineering and specifically in the area of radio frequency. So uh, all these wireless gadgets you have that are out there, they all have a radio in them. And that's a lot of what I work on. Oh, wow. So do you think, now that you mention it, that people with an engineering background or an interest in that general realm would tend in any way to be especially suited to using memory techniques, given what you know about both worlds? I think so. I look at memory as being kind of in two categories. And I know there's probably a lot more than just this, but I think of someone who has a good rote memory, like my sister or my son. My son, Caden, can just memorize things just by looking at them. Right. And he has an incredible memory. And I tried to teach him some techniques and said it messes him up. So I'm not sure how that works. But. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's other people who, who tend to have more of a process type memory. And that, those are people who, who will do a good job of deriving equations, for instance, that sort of thing. I tend to think that, uh, or I, I think that engineers tend to have more of a process type memory. And so if you can have something that's tied together in a story type form, uh, where there's some connection, like with your, your memory palaces, where you're walking through and seeing things or, or even if you just take pictures and, and tie them together in some sort of story, that 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 is that's very helpful. And one of the challenges with that actually, for me, has been memorizing equations. And you had a section on memorizing equations that was really quite helpful. I have not pursued that quite as heavily as as the scripture memory that I've been doing, but but that was very helpful. Used a few different t- techniques for that. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting because at one level. There's not really any difference in what you would do, but at another level, numbers, symbols, and other material that are uh, that's involved in equations makes it very different at the same time. So that that that's interesting to to think about the sameness and the difference all 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 in one package, and there doesn't seem to be a resolution to that. Do you think that's just a training effect from? from our birth that we're used to, you know, words and semantic content, not, not so much, you know, symbolic or representative content. I'm not sure about that. It's, it, I'm not sure. I guess I just think of, I think of like, even in philosophy, one of the, and interesting enough, I'd actually don't remember what he wrote because it's been that long and I didn't really apply myself to remembering it. But, uh, one philosopher, St. Augustine, he would always talk in story form. Mm. And so it's easier not only to remember what he said, but to digest it. I guess when you start connecting and making points, it's easier to remember. And I went to a Catholic school, so the, the other one, one of the other ones we, we read was uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, and he was in strict logical proofs. And right. his was some of the most difficult reading. I've, his was some of the most difficult reading I've ever had. And I think everyone pretty much got the lowest scores on it. On that <laughs> that particular topic, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> when reading yeah. it. So I'm not sure on that. I I um I was just thinking of one of the techniques I was using was for like X, just thinking of X men, and how that's one that I have have for that for remembering. But X, Y, and Z are also very common. Right. And uh, this is a little embarrassing. I'm not remembering what I have for Y and Z, but but. Uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, just just where you could take those letters and actually apply them to to some picture that you could combine with another one, and also having like a numerator and denominator some, somehow figure out how to have one over the other and have that be obvious. So, hmm. yeah, well, I think you yeah. th- there's many many options for for that, and there's partly the organization in the memory palace and. Then, if you do your celebrity lists and different lists, then you know a Y is always Weird Al Yankovic in my case, or some some character like that. So uh, there's certainly more you can do if you want to dive back into the equation memorization 
uh, practice and start to develop lists for so that you have something for every letter of the alphabet and something for most, if not all, of the symbols that might come up. You all have to do that. We just we just moved this spring, and that's that's uh, uh, quite thrown quite a wrench in my schedule lately. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> And it sounds like you also recently finished a, a really long course that took a number of years as well. That's true. Yes, a two-year seminary pro- course. So and it was the, during that course that I was with that. I was just going to say, for those of us who don't know what that means, what is, what is a seminary course and why does it take three years? Okay, a seminary course in this case was to become a deacon in the Orthodox Church. So Orthodox is probably more associated with Jews, but this this is Eastern Orthodox or like Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, that type. And it's just, it's theological training for three years. Right. So you cover the Old Testament and New Testament as well as church history, and there's a lot of church history. And I'm sure we didn't cover it in as much detail as there, there's just tons. <laughs> right. So, so yeah, that's, that's, so it takes, it could easily take more. In fact, I believe in the Roman Catholic Church, theirs is probably more like eight years. So quite intense there. <laughs> so heavy memory demands uh, one way or the other, I guess. Yeah, and during that time, I just, one of the, if you go back in, in history, um, a lot, there, there's a Protestant Reformation that happened and in the 1500s, and they really centered around, as far, they really centered how would you say it? They clung to the Bible saying, this is our standard. Well, that was a, not a luxury item by that time because of the printing press. But before that, it was. Mm. It was very hard or expensive to get a copy. And even going back to like the 300s or 200s, the New Testament really, for most people, didn't even really exist yet because it, it was still being propagated by hand under persecutions and such. So what they had was the Book of Psalms. That was something that a lot of Christians knew by heart. And so I just felt inspired by that, especially since our services have so much. So I started trying to memorize the Psalms, and that's that's actually where I applied a lot of the techniques that that um, that you uh, you teach is is in memorizing the Psalms. And that, that has 150 chapters. A lot of them are very short, but uh, one of them in particular is 176 verses, and another one 77. So there's some that are quite large as well. Right. But it's it's. Uh, but anyway, I started memorizing that. I don't know, five years ago, about. Mm-hmm. So. so in five years, how how far have you come? Uh, I just finished chapter 66. Not wow. well, 66 chapter. There, there, I have them scattered all over, and the the really long one, I I've just finished. Um, Verse 128. So that one, that one's coming along. And so, when you say finished, what what does what does that mean uh, in in what you are able to do having memorized it? Uh, it means I'm able to recite all 66 of those chapters. It would take it would take a couple about three hours, I would guess, to go through all of them. But it would all, all 66. I'm able to go back and recite them. Right. Maybe wow. with a little stumbling. On yeah. some, but <laughs> well, stumbling's fine. <laughs> I uh, I stumble myself. I I haven't you know been working on. A, I've been working a lot on you know ancient Sanskrit and so forth. And there, oh wow, a, a little bit of stumbling just seems to to come no matter how much I practice. So I've been two and a half years reciting a particular text for a, a collection of verses from something called the Ripu Gita, and. You know, mind wanders a little bit, and you might actually skip a line ahead, and then go backwards and and catch up. You know where you're supposed to be, but I don't know that that ever goes away. Or do you have a feeling you might nail it so that there's no a, a stumble-free version of recitation? I think that oh, some of the memory books that I've read, like one was "Remember the Word," you would tell me that you'd read that and, and knew about that. Mm-hmm. It gives the impression that once you have gone and memorized something, it's always there. And I think one of some of the things that have been helpful to me in, in the magnetic memory method is, is just learning that, that, uh, the importance of, of, uh, 
reciting it and yeah. and having a schedule where that gets seated into your mind. And and I do find that there's a chapter I'll know cold, and then all of a sudden it'll be just something in there that I miss, mm-hmm. and it'll really throw me. So yeah, I definitely find that perfection is is still a goal. It's not. <laughs> right. I felt like I've totally attained it. That's why I was saying, yeah, I could probably reset it, but depending on the chapter, there may be there may be uh, some pauses, some quite long pauses. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think that one of the problems that we have, and people speak very authoritatively about the past because the past isn't here to speak for itself. But we just don't have any demonstrations of what that was like, and I find it hard to believe that anybody would have recited without a stumble. And if anything, what we have is evidence that some of the textual variations come because they're essentially inventing a variation on the fly, you know, that's good enough or close enough, so to speak. Um, And so I don't know, it feels like we're avoiding the uh, avoiding something that isn't even a problem if it were to happen, you know, even actors on the stage sometimes have to invent new variations on what they're supposed to be saying in order to keep the show rolling, you know, and it doesn't harm the integrity of the performance whatsoever. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I, there's something that struck me when I was listening to this scholar, she was talking about how, how, uh, before the printing press, I think manufacturing and printing, um, I guess printing being part of manufacturing, but that spoiled us in a sense and skewed our thinking to where we think all these things are going to be the same. Like if you go to a a store and you look at jackets, you can have seven jackets all look the same and such. But in a time before manufacturing, everything was handmade. Everything was individually made. And that included the, the, the document. Right. And so you would have variations because of that. And it was just something that people knew and accepted. And if there was too much of a variation, then they would know that and maybe not use that tech. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the copying errors that, I mean, as a as someone who went to seminary, you probably would have come across this. There's, It's never even clear when a copying error was a copying error. You know, was it just a young woman or a virgin, etc.? <laughs> you know, they're not entirely sure and they don't have any means by which that we could be sure you know so it's almost what is the meaning behind this that we're really trying to get at i'm not sure if you would agree or disagree with that in your experience but it almost seems like there's a lot of non-issues that we get much ado about nothing over when there's deeper symbolic meaning at at play and at work in these texts yeah and, and there's another thing that comes up too that particular passage was interpreted one way in 200 BC when, uh, when they were translating the Septuagint. When I say the Septuagint, there's actually, you can't just say there's one document there either, right? Because it's, because it's been copied. So there's a few manuscripts. So you say, so I guess you could say the Septuagint, but the Septuagint was a Greek translation of the Hebrew, uh, Old Testament. And so there's one way they translated it then. And then another way that, that, um, other people translated it later. And that's where you get virgin in one case and young woman in another. So uh, that's something we also, I guess, don't take into account is, is how things, maybe even copying techniques have changed over the years. Mm-hmm. That, that at one point, there's actually a passage where it talks about, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this in the New Testament, uh, but it's called the woman caught in adultery. And that was actually something that was never originally in the text. Right. It was passed down as an oral tradition. And at some point, someone wrote that in, and it was a well-known tradition at the time, but someone wrote that in, and if they had not written that in, we would never know about the story because oral tradition was eventually lost. That's not true of anything, but I just think that's kind of interesting how that's, that was something that, that happened, and it doesn't make it an illegitimate story. It's just, it's just, that's, it's just different from how we think of things now because we think of things as being... It's printed. It's not going to be changed. Here it is. If it's going to be changed, we'll call it volume two, or not volume two, but second edition. Right, right. Or sometimes the volume two of the second edition, <laughs> as the case may be. Right, yeah. I mean, it's, exactly. it's, it's, the complexity, I think, was 
just as intense in one sense back then as it is now, but at the same time also perhaps a little bit simpler and, as you mentioned, just more expected and accepted at the same time. Right. Now, you mentioned, you know, it being nice to have a sort of scheduled rehearsal process and essentially taking that as part of the practice. Take us into what you were doing and how you were doing it, both in terms of, you know, starting with Psalm 1, how, how, what did you do to prepare? And then what does it look like when you're, you're doing your, your recall rehearsal? Well, I like to write things down a lot, so I keep track of these things. Uh, and so what I'll, what I'll do is I have, you know, on my phone, I have a note that actually lists all the, all the psalms that I've memorized, as well as the ones I plan to memorize next. And so what I start with is I will take the verse or verses. When I first started this, I made myself not do more than one verse a day. And the reason for that was just to build consistency, so I didn't... Uh, build too quickly and become discouraged when I was trying to re- remember things. Right. And so I think that was wise. At this, recently, I figured out that if I do different chapters, I can memorize two or three verses a day. So that's that's been a nice discovery. Um, but what I'll do is I'll take, in fact, the most recent one, most recent chapter, I'll kind of go through what, what I did on that one. That one is Psalm 9, and in the, the uh, particular translation I have, Psalm 9 is a combination of Psalms 9 and 10 for other people. So it's 38 verses long. It's quite long. And what I would do is is I would take and I would start the first verse and I would do that the night before. That's ideally what happens is I memorize it the night before. So I have a card and on the card I'll write down the first letter of each word. Uh, I'll put in punctuation and such. And that's just in case I really need to get unstuck. Right. And then I'll I'll go through each each word, and I will uh, have a picture for the words, and I'll have uh, the pictures interact. So, for instance, this says, "I will confess the O Lord." That's how Psalm nine, verse one begins. And so I think of like a big eye. Uh, a lot of times I'll have Mike Wazowski, that kind of eye, you know, in, in uh, Monsters Inc. But in this case, since the second one is Will, I think of Will Ferrell. So I think of Will Ferrell as a Cyclops with a big eye. Right. And so then I, <laughs> and just trying to think what I did for, for confess. I'm thinking it might be something like a, uh, a con man who's, who's uh, fessing up or something. But anyway, it'll be something where like maybe Will Ferrell hits this guy and then he, you know, fesses up. And then, and then you kind of go through this whole thing of, of uh, tying this all together you know, once I once I get those pictures in mind, that helps me get the the words in the correct order and not to forget any. And I I have a feeling that what happens when you first memorize something is that your mind kind of memorizes certain things, drops certain things, and swaps certain things. Mm-hmm. And that's what kind of really imprints on your mind. And you spend most of your time, if you're doing rote memory, undoing that. Um. And so by doing these pictures and such, and by having a storyline, I find that it, it helps me to remember the words and get the right order so that later on when I reuse those pictures and I'm no longer using them for that verse, it, uh, those words, the correct order and, and all that have been burned into my mind. So that's how I start that chapter. Then when I get down to like verse 24, let's say, and so I'm memorizing that, and this, so this is just 24 days later. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll get that verse seated in my mind, and then I'll go back and I will um, go back to like verse 20, and I will start reciting from verse 20 down to 24, and I'll do that two times. Then I'll go back to verse 1 and go from there to 24. And I'll do, the, um, the, I'll do that several times. I'll actually do the new verse 18 times in a day, and from verse one through to that about six times a day. And I just do that as I go throughout the day, just making sure, sure I have it. I probably could get by with less than that, but I find it, it helps it seat in. And then another thing that, that I find is very helpful on that is that it, um, but hang on just a second. Get that. 
my volume turned on. I just got rid of that. Okay. So another thing I find that's very helpful is that, and this is recent I found this, is that that last verse that I do or the last two verses, if I just repeat those at the end. So I come all the way to the end and then I repeat those. I find that really helps a lot. Right. And so that's, that's how I'll go through those verses. But then I also will, will recite the, um, the verses I, or the chapters I already have memorized, I'll cite 18 or more of those uh, throughout the day. So I'll just start at like, let's say it's Psalm 7, and I'll just, I'll just do 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then the next one I think is 19, 20, then 22. So I'll, I'll go through the ones that I have memorized until I hit 18 of those. And then, so that, that's how I, I typically go about my day. Right. But just as I'm working and I decide I need to take a break, I'll just go walk around and I'll recite the. Right. Yeah. I mean, it almost sounds exactly the way that I do what I'm doing with the different texts that I'm memorizing is this almost over learning of them on specific patterns and going and walking. A lot of what I do is it also involves some sort of walking. I think that, you know, the tip that you gave there, or or better said, I mean, it is a tip. I'm t- turning it into a tip, which is that you sort of compounded and compressed the idea of an eye, and I think it was Will Ferrell you mentioned, having a cyclops. Right. So, right. you know, this is a, a great way of essentially compounding or compressing things things together. But I think one of the questions that a lot of people are going to have is, you know, I will comes up so many times. So do you use that every time or do you have variations? Like, is it Will Shatner sometimes, or is it William Shakespeare that you would use, or is it always, you know, Will Ferrell? That's a good question. And one of the ones that I really have, so I will does come up a lot, but and is the one that comes up all the time and just, (laughs) just really became a challenge. And not only that, but the, comes up or a and and so I had to think of had to think of various things for them a lot of times with the I just I just don't even come up with a picture unless it's unclear that it's the or a and I just just it's easy enough to remember and slide that in uh, with with uh, and I came up with a few different ones that was the ampersand is one the plus sign is another I'm trying to remember if there was a third one on that and then I try to give them some sort of action too that makes it a little different. So it's not just that the ampersand appears or something, but like right. if I have and from, for from I I was trying to think what can I think for from, and I finally thought well I could think of a harp and it's going from from from, and so I have a ampersand that's playing a harp for instance. So I do have to for some of the more common ones I do have to come up with, with different ones. I didn't think of Will Shatner. That's a good idea. So, <laughs> Especially since he's such a character. <laughs> well, let's not forget Will Wheaton from the next generation <laughs> of Star Trek. Oh. <laughs> I mean, well, there's, really... there's another another one is just how they're dressed. Like Will Ferrell would be dressed as Elf, but he also could be dressed as some of his other characters. Right, so That right. could make it a little different, too. Yeah, because he's got all kinds of different uh, manifestations of himself throughout cinematic history and Saturday Night Live, etc. So there's really no end to especially actors because they play so many roles. Right. And another one that's challenging is is if it's I will or will I. And if you just ah. put the I in him, you don't know. Which order was it supposed to be? Uh, I mean, depending on the context. And so I, I put an action into that a lot of times too. So maybe it'll be Mike Wazowski jumping in and then suddenly becoming that Cyclops in Will. That could happen too. Or or he pops the eye out and becomes Mike Wazowski or something. Um, but um, or just the eye pops out. But but that's one way I can get order in. Right, right. Get the order. Do you ever get to, um, messed up with things like? So there's a line that I memorized: calm of mind free of craving and desirous of liberation. That's the, the end of the line. And you know, okay. it, it's like, is it 
desire or free from craving or free of craving. And then to correct it, I'll just look, no, look, it's three ofs. So then I'll get three doves in there so that I remember that. It, so it's like completely out of order, out of sequence, but it's just a correction on top of what I've already remembered so that it's, oh uh, yes, calm of mind, free of craving and desirous of liberation. And that's just the way that it got translated, right? It's kind of weird, free of craving, but right. that, that that just helps me to add an additional thing to um, to add that on there. Yeah, and the the, sal- the psalter I'm using, that's what they call the book of Psalms, is the psalter, is actually is translated by a group of monks who translated it from the Greek, and they translated it so that the meter matches the Greek meter. So you can imagine that in English, some things are a little funny and they don't necessarily go in an order you'd expect. It's, it's probably the hardest translation I've ever memorized of, of the Psalms or anything else. And that's a lot of what I run into is finding out that, you know, doing some sort of special picture, some sort of special thing that helps memorize notes this way, not the way you would normally think. Right, right. Yeah, it's, so it's interesting it, you brought that up as an example. But yeah, I run into that a lot with that one. Yeah, it's there's there's sort of no end of of little wiggly little things that can come, and of course, what we want to do is just dive in and figure it out, find little strategies as we go, and it's back to that sort of thing. You know, even if I had made a mistake, oh, it really, you know. I said free from craving sometime. It doesn't radically, you know, ruin the meaning of the <laughs> message, you know. Um, but it is it is kind of cool to have it exactly 100% correct. But sometimes those little things will happen. And I even hesitate sometimes and think, well, was it really three ofs? Maybe it was free from craving, you know. And But, <laughs> you know, I just go back and look and correct if I, if I made a mistake. Well, you just gave me a new picture for of as well. Well, I, I was using oven, but I didn't oh, hey. think of dove. Good one. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's one of those things where I'm like, why didn't I think of an oven? But for whatever reason, doves came because they just did. I don't know, peace, symbol of peace, something like that. Because earlier in the line, it says purified and peaceful. So I I often just use, and maybe you do as well, and I'd love to hear about it. I just I just almost use what the text is telling me to use like the, mm-hmm. the the perfect images seem to come from the text more often than not not always but do you have that experience as well yeah sometimes i sometimes i'll go to my google search and look up a word just to see if it'll give me a picture um i was just i was just thinking of one that was and of course now that i'm mentioning it i can't remember the word but it's it's the word for for a job in french and and it's it was one that I was just having a horrible time coming up with a picture of. So that one, I just think of like a, a guy in, in one of those, um, you know, the French beret with, with maybe a striped shirt and carrying a briefcase. So that, that was my idea of, okay, French job, that's what it is. And, uh, but, but, uh, so sometimes I'll look them up and, and I'll find pictures that way. But yeah, a lot of times if I just think about it, uh, two pictures that come for, for one word, and it'll be better than if I would have tried to, up with something that was more closely associated to the meaning of that word. Because mm. that's what you get when you look it up, is something that's associated to the meaning of the word. Right. And that's right. not necessarily what's helpful. It could be, as as you're saying with Dove, it could be something that really rhymes with it. Yeah, there's, there's a, I mean, I don't know how long it's been since you've been in the master class, but you might uh, enjoy going through it again, because I've updated it, and there's... I already I always knew these things, but I hadn't really properly enunciated it. But there's what's called the magnetic modes, which get you deeper into the potential, and it's almost like a a wheel that you can rotate through to make sure that you've tapped out every possible image that you could use, and yeah, so you sort of use the alphabet at the same time. So you know, you, you gave a very good example of I and Monsters Inc. and so forth, and then you could think, okay, so uh, that's one way of using I, but next time, who's my celebrity, for example? Well, it's, you know, Ian Mackay or whatever. And, oh, there's a serendipity or a, um, a synchronicity because it might be Ian McKellen or it might be all kinds of other people, but you just sort of rotate through your lists and then you rotate through different sensations and the conceptual, the rhyming, the 
the idiomatic or you know the kinesthetic etc there's a, there's a number of them that you can go through yeah 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 I'll, I'll have to go through that again i i don't know that i told you this but one of the big reasons or motivations i had for for um for pursuing memory well one was i was trying to learn greek and that that was that was i found your book and that's how i got uh, heard about your magnetic memory class, but I have been interested in it for a long time, uh, just by itself. I've been interested in, in improving memory, but one of the things that happened in my life is I actually had, I went through major depression and it affects your memory and it affects your logic. Now, those are the two things that you have as an engineer, your memory and your logic. So that really hit home. And, mm -hmm. and I just thought, you know, I need to go back and see if I can improve this memory, and see if that can help with, with some of the uh, some of the healing. You know, I've I've hit a lot of these other areas, but that's one that I think I need to to work on. So that was actually just kind of a, a medical reason for why I wanted to improve memory. Wow. So well, thank you for sharing that. I've I've been thinking more and more that so many more people need to hear more survival stories or healing stories and. That, that's fantastic, and I'm similar. I mean, I've never felt better since I started memorizing long-form text. It's it's very, very healing and edifying every time. What, um, what do you I think? I feel like there's no wasted time when you do that, too, you know? Right, right, Cause, yeah. Because you can do it any time. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think has been the biggest thing that you've you've learned from taking on a project like this? There's probably a few things, but I think one of the things that has struck me is I never had an idea that I'd be able to memorize that many chapters, right. um, that that much text, and it, it was a big goal. And I just I, I just thought, well, I'll put it out there and try it, and that was just amazing. And I really I really uh, appreciate not only your classes, but really when I'd write to you and ask you about things. Uh, your coaching, because that was really integral to my doing that. It wasn't just, oh, do this technique and it works, and and pretty much, pretty much, you're learning one or two type techniques. You, you really are very comprehensive in asking different people about memory things. Your study of memory and what you present on on your on your website is, is it comes from so many different angles, and it's not necessarily that one angle or another is better for the person, but I think having all those angles are helpful. Right. So I just, anyway, that's what I, that, that's what I found is, is, uh, so I guess my biggest thing is, is kind of like running a marathon. Yeah. I never thought it'd be that hard and I never thought I could do it kind of thing. It's, it's kind of along those lines because I just, I just never thought that would really be possible. I just thought I'd always be getting, you know, into, two chapters maybe, and then kind of given up because it was so much work just doing this by rote. Mm. Always forgetting stuff. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, I think that's a, that's a powerful thing because I often feel like I, I don't know the answer, but I go with my gut that giving more possible angles and more points of entry is better than having some dogmatic, this is the way it is, do it this way, and that's the end of it, you know? Because that's not only not the truth, but it's worth the risk of potentially overwhelming some people to stick with what is true, which is that more is better. And I often say, one is the most dangerous number in memory training. And you see it again and again, because the questions I mm. get is, yeah, but so-and-so said it has to be this way. And it's just like, well... Yeah. Do you think that that's even remotely realistic? Um, what if you take that in under advisement, give it a try, do some experiments, and then come back to another more foundational way or just another way, period, and keep going, keep persisting so that your action is like a fire that lights the darkness as opposed to, you know, putting blinders on that great light of knowledge that wants you to be able to achieve your goals? Yeah, it's it's really. I don't know that people typically think of memory as being a creative event, but it really turns it into that. Right. And that does help your mind develop. Mm. And I think that's one thing. If you look, if you look back in 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 history, when books were expensive and such, people people spent time learning how to memorize, and they right. spent time memorizing. And these days, when you can just look things up on 
on the computer, it really it really is uh, having, in my opinion, a detriment de- detrimental. Well, I'm having a good time. Detrimental effect, <laughs> right, right, on uh, on that part of the mind, and and maybe even other parts. So, yeah. and I just I find meditating on these, well, meditating because I'm reciting, but reciting these verses, they they just really they change your perspective, and it really it's been very helpful. It mm. Changed my perspective, helps me be more patient because if I'm just waiting in line, I'm not just waiting in line. I'm I actually have something to do. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Well, that's that's exactly what I feel and you know, I I prefer that mental content to hey, hurry up or yeah, you know, can't you figure out how to make that machine work better or whatever, you know? It's just right, so much yeah. more pleasant and yeah. peaceful and it's just like, go ahead, take your time. I'm I'm having I'm having a good time right here. <laughs> well, is there anything else that, you know, comes to mind as something that might just help somebody else who has a goal like this? So many people email me all the time. They want to memorize you know, either a scripture or sometimes they'll say, I want to memorize the Bible, which, you know, is possible, but I sometimes Mm -hmm. think maybe, you know, pick one book, maybe the book that, or the verse even, that will get you closer to God, so to speak, um, and then build progressively from there. Do you have any, any advice for someone who, who wants to follow in your footsteps and, and do something similar, either in a smaller scale or larger? Yeah, I think, I think my, one of the best things I did at the beginning was was limiting myself to one verse a day, not going too much, too far. Right. Because it's not, in one sense, at the beginning, it's not the verse that you're concentrating on. It's learning the techniques and right. and learning how over time that learning, well, that learning will continue over time. And so you will get better at it over time. But just having that patience to, to kind of take it slow at the beginning and, and, uh, and learn that. Now that said, uh, it may be something that you could do faster with a memory palace. Memory palaces are something that, that, uh, you inspired me actually to go back and start working on those again. I, I, I went ahead and, and use association and all that. And I dropped the memory palaces for a while, but I, I think, but I'm, I'm getting back into that. Right. You make it sound like it's so great, so I have to get back into it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, uh, but but I guess what I'm saying is, if you take the approach that I took, that that limiting it to one verse a day, it just it's so hard to be patient because you think, but I could do six. But you know what? In six days, you will have six, and then right. in twelve days, you'll have twelve, and you'll have plenty to manage after a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true, and. Yeah, I mean the, the the memory palace can can certainly make it speed up and and have more, and it certainly helps for me. For example, especially when I'm dealing with Sanskrit, mm-hmm. what's so powerful is that I use the memory palace for what I think it's for, which is not not the the storage per se, but for the recall rehearsal. And what it allows for is to skip between words, which makes it a lot faster. So. You know, okay. Uh, if I were to to take that phrase that I I gave you, the full thing is I am composing this treatise on self knowledge for those purified and peaceful, calm of mind, free of craving, and desirous of knowledge, or sorry, desirous of liberation. See there, we were talking about slips <laughs> and hesitations. We got one. <laughs> um, so desirous of liberation. Now. In order for me to maximize the time that I'm spent in there, that's actually on essentially four different stations, so to speak, in a in a memory palace. And so what okay. I, d- I do is I sort of skip. So I go, I am composing this treatise for those calm of mind and desirous of liberation. And then I go back, free of craving, right? for those purified and peaceful. And I'm doing it out of order. Now, that's just an example of oh. a phrase, but I also can do it, especially with Sanskrit, word by word. And what that ends up doing is it gives primacy and recency to each and everything, to use a memory science term, by using the serial positioning effect. It's a bit challenging okay. on your head, but if your memory palace is well-structured, then it's very, very easy and that helps it get into long-term memory so much faster. It's unbelievable. 
Well, I got my homework assignment there. <laughs> and it's great, great brain exercise. Probably the best you can get. And, and, and no app is ever going to beat it, I don't think. Yeah, that's, that's boy, I tell you, that's, it's just been, it's been a wonderful experience going through this. And, 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 uh, not just not just memorizing these things, but just going through and, and learning these techniques. And you probably experienced this too, where you'll be going about your day, and just something will come to mind that gets triggered by what you're by by looking around, and it's just something comes to mind, and 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 it you think about it differently then, but it wouldn't have been there if you hadn't first put it in in your mind. So like that, maybe a verse comes to mind, mm-hmm. and it's just interesting to me how I think the Psalms are especially. Um, adept at that because as a as a Westerner and such, I would tend to gravitate more towards Proverbs, where you have these you know linear proofs, or not linear proofs, but linear thoughts. And right. and the Psalms are a lot more poetic, and so they kind of come out. I wouldn't say randomly, but they kind of come out poetically as well. Mm-hmm. And if it's not there already, it doesn't necessarily come out. Like if you just go, I'm going to sit down and read this, it doesn't necessarily just come out, but but I found that this things will just pop to pop into my mind and such. It's very, it's very interesting and, and uh, just a fascinating study. Well, the, I, the, the memory and and everything on that. It's been great. Yeah. Well, you're you're almost halfway there to all 150 of the psalms. So I assume you're gonna you're gonna keep going, or do you, do you have plans to switch over to the proverbs for a while, or where where is this taking you? Well, I, I'm pl- I plan to keep going on it. Um, I have, let's see, I'm actually, I had the one verse a day or a limit, but I've actually, like I said, I've found that I can do up to three verses a day. If I do them in different chapters, it helps to do it that way. Right. Uh, and so I've actually just recently increased the speed on that. So that may, um, uh, that may, that may help out a lot. So some of the chapters that I've been hitting recently are a lot longer too. So I'm trying to get those out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and after that, I'm after that, I'm hoping maybe the Gospel of John. So we'll see. That sounds very very exciting. Um, you know, if you have any questions, just let me know. Reach out and. Again, you know, you can review. The, there's been a lot of updates since I guess it was 2015 when you first got it, and I think you'll find them them useful but uh, yeah happy to to trade notes because we're we're now at that level more than anything else but uh yeah anytime let me let me know and I'll, I'll i'll do what i can to to nudge you in this or that direction and and likewise you've already nudged me and everybody listening to uh to improve our practice and by giving us some some examples well, that's great yeah well i i do tell people about your your website because i really I really felt like that was, you know, when I first was, when I was first purchasing it, I thought, well, I don't know, we'll see. But I felt like that was just, it's opened the whole world for me. It's been great. Well, that's wonderful. So, and I really appreciate that. I appreciate you taking the time to inspire us and give us some more insight and education along our, our journeys and mine personally. And can't wait to hear the next update. Sounds good. And I, uh, I, I will go back to that website and, take a look at some of the new things you put there. I really appreciate you, that you updated that. So, My, my pleasure. <laughs> well, thank you again. And um, yeah, can't wait to hear from you again very soon. All right. All right. We'll take care. <laughs>